Greetings and welcome to Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation. To our members, friends, and everyone joining us in our virtual congregation on YouTube today. Whoever you are and whomever you love, you are welcome here. I'm the Reverend Robin Landerman Zucker, minister of this congregation, and I will be hosting our virtual worship service today with our music director, Gabriel Hernandez, our pianist, Rebecca Prisnick, and worship associate, Nancy Paxton. If you'd like to participate more fully in this service, you can pause this video and go to our website, beaconuu.com, where you can download an order of service with the unison readings and the hymn lyrics for April 26, 2020. This congregation is spiritually open and intentionally inclusive. Our members and friends bring many interests, theologies, and viewpoints to our door. Here we trust you will find a common desire for meaningful community and spiritual growth and for relevant religious exploration. Membership in our congregation is open to anyone who chooses to walk with us in the spirit of love and a responsible search for truth. As I light the chalice, the symbol of our free faith, I invite you to light your own chalice or candle at home and join me in the unison words in your order of service. We light this chalice with a flame that draws us together. With this flame, we cut through the darkness of isolation and are warmed by the fires of our inner connection. And now Nancy Paxton has some opening words for us. Nancy? The opening words are Langston Hughes' poem, Earth Song. It's an earth song, and I've been waiting long for an earth song. It's a spring song. I've been waiting long for a spring song. Strong as the bursting of young blood. Strong as the shoots of a new plant. Strong as the coming of the first child from its mother's womb. An earth song, a body song, a spring song. And I've been waiting long an earth song. Hi, and now if you'll join me in singing For the Beauty of the Earth. Of grateful praise. 
And now if you'll join me in reciting our mission and covenant. The mission of Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation is to be a welcoming community that embraces diverse thought, belief, and builds a just, peaceful, and compassionate world. Love is the spirit of this church, and the quest for truth is its sacrament. The service is um, to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in kindness. Thus do we covenant. Thank you. Now is the time in our service when you're invited to share a personal joy or sorrow in the supportive fellowship of this community. With each joy or sorrow, I drop a stone into this bowl to mark our connection to one another, even when we are apart. Although no specific joys and sorrows were sent to me this week, I will drop a stone for all of us and how we are striving to endure in the midst of the coronavirus circumstances. Locked down, separate from one another, wanting to stay safe, wanting to stay connected. For all that we know who have been affected by the virus, who are sick, who have been sick, who we worry about, who may be isolated or alone, we drop a stone for them. For all of the essential workers and all the frontline workers who are doing so much for so many at their own peril, we send them healing love and light. For all the concerns people have about their finances, their jobs and their families, those who are worried about their children or feel sorry for what they have had to miss by being isolated from their friends and their school, we drop a stone for them. And for the many joys that we still continue to find and feel, even in this difficult situation. The beautiful sunshine, the blue sky, zooming with our friends and family, believing that on the other side of this, we will be whole and connected. We drop a stone for all the joy, all the hope that remains in the world. And finally, for all those joys and sorrows that remain unspoken, because they are either too tender or too private to share. Let us remember that everyone is fighting their own private battle. We know not what it is, but because we're human, we know it to be true. So let us be kind, compassionate, flexible, and forgiving with one another. And now I invite you to come into a quiet, reflective place where you can uncross your arms and uncross your legs and just feel a sense of quiet within. The way to get there is through intentional breathing. Breathing in four beats through your nose and four beats out through your mouth in a steady rhythm. So just breathe. It's so often that we aren't really breathing very intentionally and we wonder why we feel so tight and so tense. Create spaciousness with your breath. And just breathe. Just breathe. See where you can open yourself up to more spaciousness inside with your breath. And just breathe. As you sit quietly, continuing to breathe, I offer a litany for those lost to climate change. And I will drop yet another stone for each that I mention. And I invite you to respond. We remember them. We take this time to acknowledge all those already lost as the world feels the effect of global warming and climate change. Thousands of people, as well as animals and plants, 
die every year from the effects of environmental damage. As we acknowledge those lost, please join in responding. We remember them. To all those people lost to extreme heat waves, we remember them. To all those lost to floods, hurricanes, mudslides, and other disasters caused by changing weather patterns, we remember them. To all those lost to hunger as crop patterns change, we remember them. To all those people lost to drought due to climate change, we remember them. To all those lost to disease as the environment shifts, we remember them. To all of those animals, siblings of flesh and blood, breath and bone whose lives have been lost, due to global climate change, we remember them. To all of the plant spirits, siblings of the green world, whose lives have been lost due to global climate change, we remember them. To all those species lost forever as the global climate changes, we remember them. We remember them and we commit ourselves to restoring balance to this beloved planet we share. Blessed be. Let us be silent together. Ancient Mother, I hear you calling. Ancient Mother, I hear your song. Ancient Mother, I feel your laughter. Ancient Mother, I taste your tears. Ancient Mother, I hear you calling. Ancient Mother, I hear your song. Ancient Mother, I feel your laughter. Ancient Mother, I taste your tears. Ancient Mother, I hear you calling. Ancient Mother, I hear your song. Ancient Mother, I feel your laughter. Ancient Mother, I taste your tears. Our reading today is We Too, How Long We Were Fooled by Walt Whitman. We too, how long we were fooled, now transmuted, we swiftly escape as nature escape. We are nature, 
Long have we been absent, but we now return. We become plants, trunks, foliage, roots, bark. We are bedded in the ground. We are rocks. We are oaks. We grow in the openings side by side. We browse. We are among the wild herds, spontaneous as any. We are two fishes swimming in the sea together. We are what locust blossoms are. We drop scent around the lanes morning and evening. We are also the coarse smut of beasts, vegetables, minerals. We are two predatory hawks. We soar above and look down. We are two resplendent suns. We it is who balance ourselves, orbic and stellar. We are as two comets. We prowl, fanged and four-footed in the woods. We spring on prey. We are two clouds, forenoons and afternoons, driving ahead. We are seas mingling. We are two of those cheerful waves rolling over each other and interwetting each other. We are what the atmosphere is, transparent, receptive, pervious, impervious. We are snow, rain, cold, darkness. We are product and influence of the globe. We have circled and circled till we have arrived home again. We too, we have voided all but freedom and all but our own joy. Now I invite you to sing along as I sing What a Wonderful World, made famous by Louis Armstrong. Our sermon today is entitled, We Are the Blue Boat Home, a sermon for Earth Day. In 1964, the folk activist Pete Seeger and Lori Wyatt composed the classic Somos el Barco, We Are the Boat. In it, Seeger sings, we are the boat, we are the sea, I sail in you, 
you sail in me. The stream sings it to the river, the river sings it to the sea, the sea sings it to the boat that carries you and me. The boat that carries you and me. Right now, it surely seems to be caught in a mighty storm. Pope Francis lifted up this metaphor in his Lenten homily to an empty, rainy St. Peter's Square. In it, he preached, we have realized that we are in the same boat, all of us fragile and disoriented, but at the same time, important and needed. All of us called to row together each of us in need of comforting the other. Amid this pandemic, Francis said, we have realized we cannot go on thinking only of ourselves and that only together can we do this. A fine pastoral message. And as much as I appreciate the Pope's sentiment, we are not in the same boat, really, even if we are in the same storm. The blogger Daniela Ramek wisely points out your boat could be shipwrecked and mine might not be, or vice versa. For some, quarantine is optimal, a moment of reflection, of reconnection, easing back in flip-flops with a cocktail or coffee, the great pause. But for others, this is a desperate financial and family crisis. For some that live alone, they are facing endless loneliness, while for others it's peace, rest, and time with their loved ones. Some have experienced the near death of a loved one from the virus, or maybe they've experienced it themselves. And some are not sure if their loved one is going to make it. Others don't believe this is a big deal. We've seen that on TV. They feel impervious. Some have faith in God and expect miracles. They've shown up at their churches, no masks, no gloves, claiming to be washed in the blood of Christ. Others say God is not going to save us and the worst may be yet to come. So friends, we are not in the same boat. We are in the same storm. We're going through a time when our perceptions and needs are different. Each of us will emerge in their own way from the storm. It's very important to see beyond what is seen at first glance, not just looking, actually seeing, not just seeing, but actually empathizing. So may we be especially kind to one another, look beyond whatever secure bubble we might be inhabiting and honor every situation and individual experience. There is one ship though, on which we are all passengers, regardless of our individual circumstances, the blue boat of this planet. Are you familiar with the famous lifeboat ethics experiment? It asks us to decide who is worth saving if there are not enough lifeboats for everyone. How would we decide this? How have we decided this when the passengers on our great blue boat include all living things, animals, trees, humans, rivers, glaciers? How do we decide? Who has the right to decide between a modern way of life that pollutes our planet or shared sacrifices that forestall human extinction? Yes, we are the boat and we are the sea. And unless we make some impactful changes, it will be all species and living things that go down to the sea together. However, that I do, I do believe that an awakening of awareness precipitated by the coronavirus may still enable us to be a blue boat home for this planet that we claim to cherish before it's too late. <clears throat> As this lockdown drones on, we witness increasing attempts to portray the effects of the virus on nature as a pastoral, a return to some sort of pre-industrial Eden. 
no one can deny that we are experiencing cleaner air and clearer skies. Yet as we amaze over the sound of birds chirping in Times Square and ooh and ah over dolphins in the canals of Venice or coo with delight at mating pandas, the environment is not healed. The climate crisis is not reversed. Humans have not saved the day by staying home, snookered again by Instagram. The New York Times writer, Amanda Hess, calls this the rise of the coronavirus nature genre. She notes, I don't know if panda sex is truly facilitated by the averting of human eyes, but I'm clinging to this idea. Humanity has been shuttered indoors, but our media feeds are overgrowing with tales of a revived natural world. Hess drives home the point. These fantasies, she said, are not about humans living in harmony with the natural world. The people who have decamped from cities to live in the countryside, cultivating sourdough starter and leading their broods on nature walks are eyed with suspicion. The nature images that have captured our imagination rest on total human exile. It's not a pastoral vision. It's a post-apocalyptic one. A Los Angeles Times article on Yosemite without visitors described the landscape as an imagined future where the artifacts of civilization remain with fewer humans in the mix. At a time when human life is at great risk, Hess muses, it's a little disquieting that some of us find comfort in reveling in our own obsolescence. I agree. There is a tantalizing dark escape in getting a glimpse of nature that we cannot otherwise see because we're always out there ruining the view. Most of the people sharing photos of domineering goats and marauding boars, they're not expressing a latent death wish. The appeal of the coronavirus nature genre is in part its subtle massaging of the human ego. It feeds the fantasy that centuries of environmental abuse can be reversed with an abbreviated period of sacrifice. With a few weeks supply of shelf stable food, an unhinged network docu-series says Hess, we can save the planet. Hess makes it clear enough for us. We are not living in an 18th century Jane Austen garden or the treehouse of the Swiss family Robinson. And like Hess, other keen observers are already warning us about the great gaslighting that will emerge when we are released from this lockdown and can resume some of our everyday activities. What is gaslighting? It's a psychological manipulation, a method of making us believe that what we believe is false. No, you didn't see that. No, that didn't happen. No, our way of life will not lead to human extinction. We are not to blame. The great marketing machine that stokes the American consumer appetite will crank up to make us feel good about getting back to what was. We must resist. In an essay for the blog Medium, Julio Vincent Gambuto observes that the curtain is wide open. At no other time have we been able to have this opportunity to see what would happen if the world simply stopped. And if you're like me, he continues, you're scared, confused, and heartbroken. And what a perfect time, he says, for Walmart to help you feel safe again. Gambuto warns us that what will be unleashed will be a gaslighting blitz to make us believe that we did not experience what we experienced. The air wasn't really cleaner. Those images were fake. The hospitals weren't really a war zone. Those stories were hyped. You didn't see people in masks waiting in the rain to vote. This is America. You didn't see indifference or an utter failure 
of leadership, fake news. Consider this, an image I saw online depicting an activist at the White House holding up a banner emblazoned with this astute message, the normal is the virus. Gambuto implores us from one citizen to another, I beg you, take a deep breath, ignore the deafening jingles and think deeply about what you want to put back into your life, back into this world. The Pope chimes in here too, preaching that the storm exposes our vulnerability and uncovers those false and superfluous certainties around which we have constructed our daily schedules, our habits, and our priorities. And he admirably condemns the way humanity has treated the environment, taking it for granted and seeking greed rather than justice. We carried on regardless, he said, thinking we could stay healthy in a world that was sick. The Pope's blunt declaration is all the more potent given the hubris in the Judeo-Christian tradition regarding our relationship to the natural world. Open the Hebrew scripture and in Genesis 1, chapters 1 through 25, Yahweh creates the heaven and the earth, the water and light and living creatures. It is a lovely world, one in harmony with itself. And then in verse 26, he creates humankind and says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. He goes on to encourage Adam to fill the earth and subdue it. He tells Adam, Look what I have given you to rule, every green plant, every beast, every bird, everything that has the breath of life. Perhaps Yahweh might have stopped for a moment of reflection at verse 25. Perceive just how far we have drifted from a place of balance with nature, from reverence and respect for the air, the bud, the river, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Even before the virus, we've been in a kind of self-imposed quarantine from right relationship to the earth. Did you know that the word quarantine is from a Venetian word meaning 40 days, originating during Black Death as the amount of time a ship's crew had to stay on board before going ashore? The term has biblical roots, too, as part of Mosaic Law in Leviticus, although the term of quarantine is seven days. From a religious perspective, that number 40 is familiar and significant. The duration of Lent and the time that Jesus spent fasting in the desert. Forty years, the duration Moses and the Israelites wandered in punishment, making their way to the promised land. We are in the desert now, and it has been about 40 days since we began this mandatory stay-at-home period here in Flagstaff and everywhere. What have we learned about our footprint on the planet, our role in this imbalance that contributed to this crisis, our place in the ecosystem during this bewildering time of wandering around in our living rooms and meandering through the landscape of our values and our hopes. Are we willing to make amends, to repent? It's a hard word for liberals to hear, but apt nonetheless. What constitutes a promised land for our planet, our country, our green mountain town? To be clear, it's not what we have been promised. It's what we will promise to one another and to future generations. After the coronavirus abates, we need to rebuild wisely. We cannot pretend that the mega drought predicted for the Southwest 
will not happen anymore. We cannot ignore the food crisis that looms, the irreversible devastation of deforestation and disappearing glaciers. We can support a younger generation of activists like Greta Thunberg and youth-led organizations, grassroots groups like Zero Hour, who will inherit this mess. We can support candidates and legislation that tackle climate change and environmental standards so that a failure to do so does not threaten our planet for centuries, not days, not weeks, centuries. Dennis Hayes, who founded Earth Day 50 years ago as a teach-in about environmentalism, rallies us to the cause writing this week in the Seattle Times. COVID-19 robbed us of Earth Day this year, so let's make Election Day Earth Day. This November 3rd, vote for the Earth. Through the Earth and our willingness to love it and learn from it, we become aware of our deep spiritual and energetic connection to all life, all beings and how our action or inaction sets the great interdependent web a tremble. As Walt Whitman reminds us in the poem we heard earlier, we are nature. We are what atmosphere is, transparent, receptive, pervious, and impervious. We are snow, rain, cold, darkness, we are each product and influence of the globe. We can pledge our allegiance to something bigger than recycling, reusable shopping bags, or composting, all very worthwhile practices, but not enough to prevent human extinction. The water is wide, but take heart. We are the boat. We are the sea. I sail in you, you sail in me. So may we pledge allegiance to the earth itself, feel the sea flowing in our veins, and row our beloved blue boat out of the tempest and home together. Just such an inspiring pledge was written by my colleague, Vern Barnett. I pledge allegiance to the earth and all life, the fields and streams, the mountains and seas, the forest and deserts, the air and soil, all species and reserves, habitats and environments, one world, one creation, one home, indivisible for all, affected by pollution anywhere, depleted by any waste, endangered by greedy consumption, degradation by faithlessness, preserved by conservation and reverence, the great gift renewed for all generations to come. So may it be, blessed be, blessed we, blessed she, ancient mother. Hello. Please join me in singing Blue Boat Home. I 
the starry sea, leaning over the edge in wonder, casting questions into the deep, drifting here with my ship's companions, all we kindred pilgrim souls, the making away by the lights of the heavens in a beautiful blue boat home. I give thanks to the waves upholding me, hail the great winds urging me Infinite sea before me, sing the sky, my sailor song. I was born upon the fathoms, never harbor or port have I known. The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat. During this time of being together apart, we continue to take an offering each week for our congregation and for our community partners. You can make an online secure donation through Vanco on our website, beaconuu.com, or send a check to us at our Flagstaff address with offering in the note. We appreciate your generosity now and at any other time during the year. Typically, at the end of our service, we join hands, and of course, we're not doing that now, but we can imagine ourselves joining hands and feel the sense of being beacon, always connected, and the warmth of our community. So I invite you to do that and to join me in saying the unison benediction. Now, go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, Return to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, and honor all beings. May you stay safe and well. We are Beacon, always connected.